the least of all in the world of higher education and I guess um, across the board because many of the issues in higher education are, are in no way unique, uh, I guess, to, to higher education. Let's maybe start off with uh, who Pedro is. Uh, I mean, uh, just your background, where did you grow up, some of your own early influences that you feel determine the path that uh, your life is taking on. Yo, <laughs> I didn't expect this one. Um, you didn't expect this one? I chief scalap on Oh, Okay, so <clears throat> I think, I, I, well, I guess I was born in Israel, uh, me and King Lemstad in the Eastern Cape. Uh, 30 years ago, that is where I was. That's where I grew up. That's where I did my basic education schooling. Then I moved to Nelson Mandela University. Afterwards, mm -hmm. I come from a family of teachers. I was raised by black women, you know. Uh, so everything I, I I knew growing up um, had something to do with education. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. And also, mm -hmm. I was raised by my grandmother as well. We had so many stories to tell about uh, Israel, how it comes from, how it came to be what it is. So mm -hmm. I would say my conscientization, my conscientization politically um, was always, always had this astute relationship with education and the power mm -hmm. that education uh, can have in changing the community and changing our political landscape as a whole. So I always knew from school, coming also into education, that sure, wherever sure. I go, I will end up uh, having something to do with education or the public service, and that is what I do. So mm -hmm. I've always been committed um, to the craft uh, of learning, uh, conscientizing the black child, because I think that is where we are going to change our society when sure, we shape sure. the thinking of um, black young people. And that is what I've been doing uh, in education throughout the years. So I've been in high education for for the past 10 years. Uh, mm. I've experienced all its transitions uh, so far, and it's been a wonderful space uh, to contribute in towards the trajectory that we're currently under as a, as a country. Mm, mm. And it's also, I guess, you know, higher education, a very interesting microcosm of very much of what we see uh, across <clears> our society. Um, and maybe talk to me, I guess, about what what you've always seen as the sort of political economy of higher education and how that has given rise to all of the things that we often talk about in reports. Right. Uh, it might be lack of student housing, uh, students effectively, you know, in many cases, uh, living in slums, uh, not enough infrastructure, but also, I guess, uh, the issue of fees and how that loomed large uh, at a critical time where you were also in student mm. leadership as uh, SRC president. I think the best place to begin, just to simplify it quickly, is that um, all our universities in South Africa, um, they were built during colonial and apartheid times, including the cities where they are located. If you look at East London, you look at Johannesburg, you look at Cape Town, and the universities inside those cities, they look exactly like Europe. You know, if you if you if you've travelled to Europe, especially to places like Oxford and London, uh, the way the cities are organised, the way universities mm -hmm. are organised, they are similar. So, in essence, the project of coloniality was to make white people feel comfortable wherever they go. You know. So whether they're in Europe, whether they're in Australia, whether they're in South Africa, everything must look like Europe. And that is also resembled in the knowledge that we invite, you know. So with higher education, simply because you have a degree or a master's or a PhD, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are educated per se, especially in our own universities, because mm. you, can, you can go through the system and absorb poison, you know, that would... Mm. Uh, make you go out of the university and do the total opposite of what you're supposed to do to liberate your own people. And that is what we see today, you know. So we have people with power in institutions of influence, but they're not doing the necessary work that was supposed to be done. And we call them qualified because they've imbibed the poison that institutions of high learning are supposed to do. So that is why the program that young people have been raising since 2015 to decolonize institutions of high learning is so important. It's about our humanity. It's about restoring who we are uh, as a nation. And that is the program that I have been persuaded uh, persuaded under. I knew from the very first time I was doing first year that 
I don't like what I'm being taught here. I don't like the content that is lecturers are delivering. So I made a commitment that I'm going to study this discipline all the way to the end. And I will be a lecturer and produce a different knowledge that is going to emancipate the mindset of uh, the black child. Mm. Because I believe that each and every professional that we have in institutions of influence, including yourself as a host of Metro FM, you are a product of a particular set of knowledge that you sure. imbibe at a particular point in time. Mm. So nothing happens in society out of neutrality. It is a product of a certain a cohort of ideas that were implanted in your head, and that is what you transmit on a daily basis. So Mm. the space of knowledge must never be taken for granted because that is where everything rises and falls in every single thing that we do in society. And I guess it's a terrain of struggle. Um, And and I think that's that's what I'm getting from what you're saying, that uh, in many ways that is a, a firm trench um, in whatever, you know, cultural, political, economic, and social warfare. Um, that many, many people, uh, many young African and black students who go to institutions like the Nelson Mandela University um, find themselves in. Um, and, and I'm quite interested, I guess, in how you, you also speak about these notions of urban citizenship, studentification. I, mean, I, didn't, uh, you know, I didn't know that, uh, uh, that concept and I find it quite interesting. I mean, uh, so, so talk to me about how that finds expression in some of your work. Um, and also, I guess, in some of the teaching work that you do, um, picking up the traditions, as you said, coming as you do from a, from a, uh, a family of uh, teachers and many people who are interested in, in the project of education. In my PhD, the main message I was driving home was that, firstly, each and every black family is changing since uh, 94. Uh, let's make a simple example. Back in the day, during the times of uh, labor migration. Black families used to lose mainly male figures of the family, and they would ordinarily be in their 30s, in their 40s, and they would go to the mines to look for work. So migration in the black family used to occur amongst males who are in their adult life. But since 94, we're now beginning to experience something quite unique and different in black families, where now, it is a 17-year-old and an 18-year-old that migrates from the family. And they go to the city for themselves to face that place in isolation as individuals. And we're talking about a 17-year-old, their first time out of the family, and they're not going there to work. They are going there in the city to be students. And mm. over, the overwhelming majority of, of, of young people in their in the age of 17, 18, when they go to universities, there are high chances that they will stay inside the city because we no longer have small universities with small classrooms where everyone stays on campus. So, Our universities now are massifying because under apartheid, they were only built for about 10 or 20 professionals who are going to be white and so on. Um, but now universities are massifying. Everyone must go to university. So they, institutionally, they are bloating out into the city. So residences are now being built into the city, and we have 18-year-olds now scattered in that city. So Mm. the concept of studentification speaks about that, the changing landscape of our cities now, and they are becoming more younger and more studentified. There's a high population of students now scattered all over Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, Mm. and, uh, and Johannesburg. And that introduces a completely new dynamic for municipalities to comprehend. Sure. Uh, for communities to comprehend. So our political economy of education now has changed drastically uh, over mm. the past uh, 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 15 years. And these are very complex questions that we have to deal with. And they speak yeah. at the yeah. core about the urban landscape, how the land question is organized in the city and how it affects the mm. daily life of the students. So that's what the point I was driving in my sure. PhD. Sure. I, f- I find that comment so interesting because, you know, as you were talking, um, even though the examples you use are urban examples, I might even extend that to what many people might call sort of tier two or secondary towns or, you know, uh, at those mm-hmm. types of areas. King Williamstown, you know, because in many ways, many of the, you know, areas in those places as higher education has expanded and there hasn't mm. been an attendant investment in infrastructure for residential accommodation for students. What has happened is, uh, you know, the creation of student communities within communities. 
Um, and mm. as you say, that's created its own dynamic for municipalities, for the spatial organization of those towns, um, and potentially, I guess, the path uh, of spatial growth of those towns, uh, because it introduces a new dynamic that's a bit different to, you know, the, the sprawl of saying you want to go build an RTP uh, or a new settlement mm. or a new township. Um, and, and I think for me, that, that type of social change, um, I don't know. I mean, has it translated into how we then understand the change in our cities and, by extension, how, how and what we teach in the classroom? Mm. Yeah, I know you're spot on. Correct. And if you look at these small towns I'm mentioning, Alice, mm. um, Grahamstown, Stellenbosch, uh, today, those towns survive because those universities now are the major employers of those towns. Mm. Mm. Um, in fact, those universities now are, are the economy of those towns, you know. So when you are a vice chancellor of hotel Bosch or Rhodes, you are close to being a mayor as well, you know. And um, even the notion of building universities in small towns explains the logic of the colonizer at the time, you know. How, how did they conceptualize what a university is, its purpose, and also their intentions of designing these kind of things, you know. So they wanted you to be isolated in a small town because when you imbibe knowledge, you need to be isolated. And one of the key things that uh, higher education does now to you as an individual, as an individual, it firstly deculturalizes you. You right, you get to learn in a foreign language that is different from your own. Right. In other words, you get to uh, depart from your culture and from who you are from your language. And that is very dangerous because it is from culture Ayabonga where you get the necessary tools to interpret your reality, you know, uh, how you know what time it is, how you know what the essence of success means to you, your, your, your idea of manhood, all those things, you derive that meaning and tools from your culture that is informed by your language. So once, once you get to imbibe this foreign concept of, uh, of education, in an isolated town, far away from where you belong, right? You get now to be alienated from your community and from the kind of a person that you are. So part of the post-apartheid project, in my view, should be the building of these institutions in a manner that will be in congruence with the communities that we're trying to build as well. There mustn't be a Chinese wall between communities, education and universities, the teacher, the student and the family. All those different um, ecosystems of life, they must coexist together. And for me, that would be an, a unique African project of education that could make us imagine other aspects of life that are so important to us, such as families, the economy, and so on, right? Um, I think some of the things that I'm mentioning came out strongly from, from, from the book that you've written, uh, I must admit, I haven't finished reading it. I'm glad we're having a chat today. I wanted to congratulate you on the on the on the on the publication. Uh, so, part of your own work as well, the the, the 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 planting of ideas on paper for distribution to young people mm. is part of the important project of conscientization, sure, driving us sure. towards the society that we want. Yeah, definitely. And you know, Petro, the other thing, and uh, thank you so much, man, for, you know, for, for those kind of words uh, insofar as some of my own work is concerned. But I'm also interested in something else. Um, and, and, you know, when I introduced you earlier on, I said you're a, you're a scholar activist. Um, oh. Because I'm interested in, in this bridge for yourself that you've created between the academy and what I would call the sphere of local governance in a metro that has its own historical, political, industrial, and social significance to the people mm. of the Eastern Cape, South Africa, and I would say even the world. Um, how has that experience been? I mean, I know you haven't been there for maybe for long enough, uh, but, but, but I mean, talk to me about how that experience has differed from mm. the space of academia, but more importantly, how it's also sort of infused your own intellectual interests with some of the tasks that we need to do in the policy space and the governance space you know, and, mm. uh, I guess in the space of building our communities and our localities. Yeah, I've, I've been in the municipality for the past three months now. Uh, and one thing, I can mention two things that I've, I've noticed so far. One, man, Ayabonga, our our province has 
de-industrialized, my brother, in massive scale. You know? <laughs> sure. um, and that is at the core of the unemployment crisis in the Eastern Cape. This province yeah. and these cities we have in the Eastern Cape were built from a factory economy that mm. boomed largely in the 30s and in the 60s. And the sure. deindustrialization that took place in the 80s all the way up until now uh, is at the core of the sadness that I witness around me. And mm. this unemployment crisis, right, is, is breeding other layers uh, of structural problems that are overwhelming the municipality on a daily basis, you mm. know. And there's no plan in place to counter uh, that problem of deindustrialization. So unless municipalities get reactivated and revitalized to be centers of unlocking an industrial economy, we are going to continue having these very same problems that we have. So mm. one of the major areas for me that I, that I think municipalities should pay attention to that, that I have observed so far is how then do we modernize and trigger the major areas of the city to unlock this industrial economy that we want. You can't have mm. factories in East London if your railway lines are not modernized if your port sure, is dysfunctional, sure. if your roads and infrastructure are not up to date, you know? So all those things, they 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 overlap to affect water, to affect mm. electricity, to affect service delivery, to affect many other areas that I see uh, around me. So when I look at how the city now is, is happening from the inside and, and looking at the the, the overlapping impact it also has on universities as well. These two institutions are are sort of, you know, tied together, and they are both going south because of these problems that I'm, I, I'm mentioning. Mm. For example, mm. um, it was very difficult to attract uh, a top professoriate and international students to Rhodes because the Makana municipality was not providing uh, water supply to the university. Do you remember that? You know? So yeah, the relationship, yeah. yeah. So so the relationship between these two institutions needs to be, they need to coexist for mm. the city to function, for the economy to function. So the low levels of growth in our in our sure. cities, the, the municipalities at the core. So that's mm. what I've been observing uh, okay. for the past okay. three months, Pedro, uh, and I think that's where we need to do some yeah. work. Yeah, yeah. Look, man, my brother, ish, you know, see a city which have a little Asia. Um, and, uh, you know, I would have loved to, to dabble in, in many other discussions. Yeah. Uh, but it's so unfortunate man, that uh, the format sometimes doesn't allow for that. Uh, because I would have wanted us to talk also about um, political organization generationally. Um, and I guess questions of, of succession, questions of organization in, in a new terrain. But uh, maybe let's keep those and bank those for another time. But Mantabatil Tubandi Bulele. Uh, for the great work that you've done. And uh, yeah, I wish you all of the best, man. Thank you so much.